Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Thanks everyone for joining us today. I wanna to give a warm welcome to General Sir Nick Carter. Uh, General Carter, thanks for, for joining us today. Uh, he assumed the appointment of uh, Chief of the Defense Staff in June of 2018. Prior to this, General Carter was the Chief General Staff, the professional head of the British Army. Um, he's had tours of duty in Iraq as a brigade commander in 2003 and 2004, and then repeated tours where I encountered him in Afghanistan between 2002 and 2013. And for those who don't know or, or haven't been aware, also was instrumental in the concept of the provincial reconstruction teams in Afghanistan and then um, efforts to, to build the Afghan National Army. So thanks for your, for your service, uh, General Carter, and really appreciate you joining us today. No, it's great to be with you, Seth, and thanks for giving us the opportunity to, um, to describe what the UK is up to in military terms at the moment. Great. Well, I promised I wouldn't start off with a particularly difficult question, uh, such as uh, explaining to us the, uh, the the failed European Super League efforts uh, in the UK, because many of us watch uh, uh, Eng English football. But I did want to uh, begin by talking about the US-UK uh, special relationship. And the integrated review notes that the US will remain the UK's most important strategic ally and partner. So what I wanted to get from you is your perspective moving forward. How important is the UK-US uh, military relationship? And in some ways, how is it a little bit different moving forward than, say, it was during the Cold War or even the years after 9-11? After how, how important and, and what are we looking at moving forward? Yes, I mean, um, I think it's a very interesting angle at the moment. I mean, if you if you look back over the last 75 years, the world has evolved hugely. Um, and it was a bipolar world in the Cold War. Um, and of course, we fitted very neatly into the, the pole that the US led. And then what happened as the Cold War came to an end is we ended up in that extraordinary period where it was about counterterrorism, it's about stabilization operations, benign interventions, those sorts of things, where it was essentially a unipolar world. And of course, as we've emerged from um, that period of um, sort of terrorism and all that went with it, it's now much more, isn't it, a multipolar world in which it's a very, it's a much more complex set of competitions that are going on. It's great power competition. And I think, therefore, you know, when you think about how you frame your own national interest in relation to that sort of competition, I mean, it's, it, it's obvious that we've always had a very close relationship with the United States. But how that relationship is now managed in what is a much more complex world than the one that we've had in the past, I think is a really interesting set of questions. And of course, it's underpinned by the fact that we represent exactly the same values and standards and this notion of freedom and a desire, and as indeed our integrated review says, to make sure that we have an open and resilient international order that protects human freedoms. Uh, and we stand for that alongside the United States and always have done. So I think in values terms, it's very easy to make it come together. And of course, as part of that and underpinning it, I mean, over the years, we've had a hugely close intelligence and security relationship. And although we talk about the five eyes, I think the, the sort of notion of two eyes is also right at the heart of what we do. And speaking personally, um, although we often talk about two nations being separated by a common language, I've had the great privilege of commanding 20,000 uh, US Marines and 25,000 US Army in my career for a year in southern Afghanistan in 2009 and 10. Um, and it was not a difficult task to do uh, because we saw things in almost exactly the same way. So I, I think you know that strengths and depth of relationship is particularly in the intelligence area, it's particularly in the military, but it's there nationally as well, um, because I think that, you know, we absolutely share the same values and standards and underpinning principles about the way the world should look. Um, and I think that's absolutely vital as we enter a period where it's a multipolar world, which is going to be quite challenged in terms of um, the ideologies that we stand for. So one aspect of, of a multipolar world is as we look at Russian and Chinese capabilities um, and what they're putting their resources into, we're seeing 
Stealth technologies, uh, fifth generation aircraft, long range precision strike. Uh, Russians looking at their long range fire uh, and missile capabilities. As you look at competition with some of the countries, including the Chinese and the Russians, and you look at their their capabilities over the next five to 10 years, what are you most concerned about? And, and how are you thinking about both with the United States, but also with the UK's European allies and partners countering? And that could be both for deterrence as well as if deterrence fails, having to fight. No, indeed. I mean, I think the first thing to do is to is to look at um, how both those countries you referred to uh, are trying to achieve their objectives at the moment, because we talk a lot about the notion of hybrid warfare. We talk about the grey zone. We talk about conflict below the threshold of war. I mean, the reality, of course, is if you look at both their systems, uh, they regard the global context as being a continuous struggle where non-military and military means are used unconstrained by that definition of peace and war that we apply. And therefore, one has to be conscious, I think, that the way in which we used to um, provide deterrence during the Cold War, where it was relatively clear cut, you know, escalation management was essentially up and down one ladder. Now, of course, it's a much more complex frame in which you have to manage deterrence. And you also have to recognise that if you're going to prevent your opponents from achieving their objectives with fait accompli strategies, as we've seen in Crimea, on the edges of Ukraine, and perhaps also in the South China Sea, you've got to be competitive. And certainly what we've done is to think about uh, a new operating concept, what we call our integrated operating concept, which, which seeks to introduce a fifth C to the deterrence paradigm. We've always talked about credibility and capability, communication and um, comprehension. We now add competition to that because we think you've got to compete in order to deter and to prevent your opponents achieving their objectives through fait accompli strategies. So I think one has to frame it in the right way before one then gets into a question about the sorts of capabilities you might need in the event of a hot war occurring. And that, of course, is where we have vulnerabilities, um, because we should be in no doubt that they've studied our Western way of war, which has been, frankly, played out in the media over the last 20 to 30 years. And they have found quite clever ways around it. And we need asymmetric responses to those clever ways around it. Um, and we need to think very hard about what it means to our doctrine of deterrence, what it means to escalation management. And overriding all of this, I think the greatest challenge we've got is unwarranted escalation leading to miscalculation. And, and my judgment is that that's the area that we military and for that matter, the policymakers we work for need to be most conscious of at the moment. So you mentioned uh, gray zone, hybrid, irregular activities. We talked a little bit about the Russians and the Chinese. I want to talk. I want to come back to to uh, to those countries, and I want to come back to the Indo-Pacific in a moment. But I did want to add one more. And uh, the the, uh, the the UK has military capabilities in the Middle East. There is until we get to a a, a nuclear deal, um, and even even with a nuclear deal, there's still growing concerns about. Uh, the expansion of Iran's uh, missile capabilities. Uh, the Israelis came out recently with uh, a, a potential for a 5,000 kilometer range. Uh, we see lots of activity from the RGC, including the Quds Force, um, swarming capabilities, mining. What's your sense about kind of the, uh, the, the threat from Iran and how to counter that, particularly maritime related activity? Well, again, I mean, I think um, one of the challenges we've got is that both Russia and China are not shy of giving their technologies and their capabilities to proxies. Uh, and of course, that's why we see, I think, some of the spread of some of this technology to other countries that perhaps we might regard at the moment as being our rivals or indeed opponents. And the answer is that um, what Iran, I think, is doing very successfully is to work out what are our weaknesses and our vulnerabilities and to target those using asymmetric means. And frankly, it's no different to yours and my old enemy, the Taliban, who identified our strengths and weaknesses and worked out how to manoeuvre around them. So that's what's happening. Uh, and I think what we need to make sure we do is not is not just to simply follow suit. We also have to work out where their strengths and weaknesses are and how we might target those in a more nuanced way than perhaps some of our technologies might suggest at the moment. So, General Carter, you you uh, you just mentioned the the Taliban, um, the uh, the uh, 
Biden administration just announced a withdrawal of, of all U.S. forces this year. And I know you've spent, as have I, considerable amount of time in Afghanistan. I don't really want to rehash the past, per se, um, but I want to I want to talk looking forward. There have certainly been concerns from the U.S. intelligence community about the future trajectory of the war with a departure of U.S. and, and European forces from the theater. And from your perspective, uh, what what are the kinds of issues that uh, that we collectively need to think through over the next year or two? Um, I, I, and, and what are the primary objectives we should set? I mean, a Taliban overthrow of the government, I think, would be a, a loss uh, for, for all. So w- what are our goals and how do we go about achieving them, at least in the in the near term? Yeah, I mean, I think I think there are probably broadly three scenarios that could play out now. I mean, I think scenario one is the sort of nightmare scenario, which is you revert to the 1990s. And you end up with the country fragmenting along tribal and ethnic lines. And you see the warlords who are, let's face it, are still alive and well, the Dostroms, the Atters, the Ishmael Khans, they're still out and about. If they start to create militias and you then see regional actors, um, neighbours, hedging behind those militias, you end up with the same set of circumstances that we had in the in the 1990s. And that would be, I think, the, the nightmare scenario. So that's the first scenario. The second scenario, I think, is that the the current government carries on. Uh, It holds the state together. The state institutions, particularly the security forces and the army, remain loyal to it. And it is able to retain sufficient uh, control over the population centres to be able to be regarded as a a legitimate uh, and uh, coherent uh, government. And then the third scenario, which perhaps is a slightly more hopeful scenario, is that the second scenario leads to a conversation and you end up perhaps with the political wing of the Taliban recognizing that its center of gravity is its political legitimacy. And therefore, it has to come to some sort of compromise with the existing government. And it ends up with an integrated government, um, albeit it won't be quite what we might have designed when we first thought about it back in 2002. But on the other hand, it might be a, a country that we can regard as a legitimate country which would embrace um, international influence and money and diplomatic presences and so on and so forth, uh, and which we would hope perhaps might keep international terrorism out in the way that we fought for over the last 20 years. Now, the fact of the matter is that the second scenario could either go north to the first scenario or south to the second scenario. And whatever we might or might not think about the decision that's been made, it's changed the facts on the ground. And in changing the facts on the ground, There is now um, a a moment, uh, an opportunity, perhaps, as well as a risk. And I think that if we can encourage uh, the parties to seize the opportunity, then there's no reason to suppose that the third scenario couldn't play out. That's how I would see it. Now, of course, a lot of it depends upon you know how you get to that point. A lot of it depends upon uh, people taking risks. Um, And I and I think you know whether the existing Afghan government is prepared to take the risks to enable the third scenario to play out, very much depends upon how they retain their confidence. And what we have to do as an international community, I think, is to try and underwrite that confidence in the Afghan state of today. And of course, you know, the the population who remain loyal to that state. And that's that's a trick we have to pull off uh, as we look to the future and as we begin to extract from Afghanistan. But I'm not entirely pessimistic. Uh, I, I think it is it is reasonable to think that you could end up with a compromise. The question is, who's going to um, offer the compromise first, and then how you get that conversation to occur, and how you get the Taliban back to the table. Um, I hope after Eid, which ends on about the 13th or 14th of March. Yeah, and I think it'd be interesting to watch how a number of the neighboring countries, Pakistan, Iran, Russia, respond uh, over the next year or two as well, because they will definitely have a say in the future of Afghanistan for good or or ill. I wanted to, to talk briefly and, and come back to the integrated review and move us a little bit further geographically into Asia. The The integrated review talks a lot about the the, uh, the the role of the UK in the Indo-Pacific. It's obviously an area important to the US with the rise of China. So can you just take a moment to, to talk about uh, the, uh, the UK military's thoughts about its evolution in the Indo-Pacific? And I'll have a follow-on question after that. 
No, sure. I mean, I think, you know, like all this, it, so much of it depends upon how you define the Indo-Pacific. You know, and for us, um, I mean, I think, you know, our, our tilt is very much about India as it might be about the Pacific. And indeed, I think, you know, the, the weight of emphasis is probably towards the Indian Ocean and indeed to India. Uh, now, obviously, as we play our way through this great power competition that, you know, your country and mine are now involved in, one needs to recognise it's a multidimensional game of checkers. And if you're talking about India, you're quickly talking about Pakistan, China, and of course, Russia, given India's connections to Russia. So how all of that plays out and the way in which one achieves one's national objectives in a realistic way uh, is, is complex, to say the least. So from our perspective, I think, you know, there will be more of a presence um, east of Suez, to coin that expression. I suspect there'll be less of a presence east of Singapore. I think it will be episodic and we are going to deploy our, our carrier strike group as far as the Pacific this year. And indeed, we have the US Marine Corps on board, which we're very grateful for, uh, to fill out the air wing to the level that we'd like to have it at. I think you'll see us uh, playing much more, particularly with the Five Powers Defence Agreement, and it is the 50th anniversary of that alliance, and we'll be connected to that. Uh, we're keen to have observer status of ASEAN. Uh, we are to have a very close relationship with Japan, which we're building on, and of course, we've obviously got the Five Eyes partnership, of which we're the only one without a Pacific coastline, if you want. And our connection into that is, is something that we will play to. But my judgment is it's going to be probably more of an emphasis in relation to the India bit of Indo-Pac in terms of the way that we see it. And the rest of it will be episodic, but it'll nonetheless happen. I think what's quite important, though, for us to reflect on is that one of the things that our integrated review did say is that we will reinforce our commitment to NATO and to European security. And what matters to the UK very much uh, is the fact that the Euro-Atlantic area needs to be stable. And we have a very important role to play in that in relation to NATO. And clearly, with the United States having to tilt or pivot, as the word was used by President Obama, more towards the Pacific, you know, that might well be that we play more of a complementary role in relation to the United States in other parts of the world Recognising, of course, that the, the challenges that China presents and the threats that Russia pre present are global. Uh, and that doesn't necessarily mean that we all need like bees around a honeypot to gravitate to the Pacific Ocean. It might well be that we need to be thinking hard about vacuums in countries like Afghanistan or other countries in Africa or whatever else it might be. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a complex web and we just need to be focused on what the competition looks like and therefore, how that plays into regions that might be more relevant to us than to others. So I wanted to talk about some of those regions. The U.S. is in the is in the midst of its posture review. I suspect, based on where those conversations are going, uh, the, there already has been a drawdown of U.S. forces from Africa. Uh, I suspect there will likely be a continuing withdrawal from some areas of the Middle East, uh, at least in terms of um, of numbers of forces on the ground. Uh, there probably will be an uptick in foreign military sales. But when it comes to the Middle East and, and Africa, the UK has discussed this concept of persistent engagement. And I guess the, the question is, you're talking about some pretty expansive areas. What does persistent engagement mean? And what are the kinds of threats that, uh, that you're most concerned about in, in some of these areas? Yeah, I mean, I think if one goes back a step, I mean, I think both our countries uh, will have learned and we're hope, hopefully applying some big lessons from the campaigns of Iraq and Afghanistan. And for me, one of the big lessons that I, uh, I learned, particularly from Afghanistan, is if you don't have adequate insight and understanding before you arrive in a theatre of operations like that, you're going to make an awful lot of mistakes in terms of who you might think are your natural allies and bedfellows as you seek to try and stabilize the countries you're in. And of course, you need to understand the politics. And what we're, what we're really suggesting here is that if you can identify those areas that are of interest to you in, in regional and indeed in country terms, if you can over a period of time develop genuine insight and understanding, which takes you into culture as well, then there's a reasonable chance that you will be able to solve the problem before it becomes a problem. So th that's part of it. The other part of it as well, of course, is that you know we are conscious that if you create vacuums, they will be filled by your authoritarian rivals. And in partnering indigenous forces, 
probably against violent extremism as the most likely challenge, you are nonetheless building their capacity, creating relationships, which, if you get your soft power right, will mean that the vacuum will not be created and that what we stand for in the West will perhaps be espoused by that partner. So persistent engagement is also about that. It's a rec recognition that the global competition we're in, this stuff that's happening below the threshold of war, does mean that you need to avoid vacuums being created and you need to make sure that you're filling them in a positive way. Now, you can't do that everywhere. You know, clearly one's going to have to prioritise. Clearly you're going to have to work with other partners. And I would expect us, for example, to play a complementary role to the French. You can see the French being busy in Francophile countries. And you could see us perhaps being busy in Anglophile countries so that we're properly coordinated in the way we do what we do. So I think that's where we're coming from. I think what I would really emphasize, though, is this point about soft power, because both the United States and the United Kingdom, you know, we are reference customers when it comes to training and education. And some of our institutions, whether it's West Point or in this country, Sandhurst or Dartmouth or Cranwell, these are world class training and education institutions, which our indigenous partners want to come and be trained in. And it's you know quite revealing that probably last year or maybe two years ago, um, three out of the leaders in the GCC had been educated at Sandhurst. Now, that is soft power being wielded in the most effective way. And actually upping the ante on that and offering more opportunity for people to do that. And indeed, creating, as we've done in Afghanistan, a, a Sandhurst in the sand, where you can make that culture come to the country that you want to have as a partner. I think you're beginning to get the sort of soft power across, which, frankly, our authoritarian rivals are not able to deliver. Now, we can't compete with the weapons imports and exports that those countries are doing. We can't compete with the money that's available. But the soft power bit, we definitely can compete with. So my judgment is that's what persistent engagement is about. It's about a nuanced approach to win the competition in great power terms, but also in parallel to get after that challenge, often of violent extremism and what, and what that stands for, by building and developing the capacity of your indigenous partners in their countries and in their regions. There's another part of persistent engagement, which uh, I wonder if you could weigh in on, which is the technological side of whether it's intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance, the entire uh, command and control backbone, the digital backbone for uh, for sensors. Uh, where this 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 raises a broader question is is and it's a subject as part of the the um, uh, joint review that's going on in the U.S. Where do you see warfare? And I don't just mean kinetic. Uh, there's an important soft power component. Where do you see warfare headed? I mean, there's a lot. Even if you look at the Chinese, a lot of focus on directed energy weapons, smart, uh, swarming drones, artificial intelligence. Where do you see warfare going and and how do you put it all together into a system? How, how are you thinking through these kinds of issues? Yeah, I mean, I think... I think we believe that the future is going to be about a competition between hiding and finding. And I think we feel that um, we've always talked about um, the two key principles of war that matter to us are economy of effort and concentration of force. And I think the irony of this competition between hiding and finding and the way in which the future battle space is evolving is that it may well be a weakness to concentrate force, because you may find that by generating mass at a single place, that what you actually do is you open yourself up to being found and then by being smacked by these really quite sophisticated um, weapons that our opponents have now got. So I think one's got to think in a very different way about how you're going to fight on this, ba on this battlefield. It's going to be a battlefield of dispersal. It's going to be a battlefield about hiding and finding and then working out how you outmaneuver your opponent accordingly. But it's also going to be a battlefield that is going to be let's face it, a, a system. It's not going to be about the industrial age of platforms that you know we grew up in. It's going to be about how you systemize things. And that's going to require a level of integration, what we call multi-domain integration. I think it's a bit like your Jazz C2 concept that you're talking about, which effectively means that the, 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 the five parts together, the sum of them adds up to much more than the individual parts just linked together. And here we're talking in our five domain term about the new domains of cyber and space and, of course, the traditional ones of maritime land and air. And, and I think the holy grail for us as militaries is how you can do that horizontally, 
but also vertically from the strategic level down to the tactical level. And if you can achieve the digital backbone that enables that to occur so that your effectors, um, your sensors and your deciders are all connected into that digital backbone in the way that, um, let's face it, the outside world has managed with iPhone, then I think you're beginning to get yourself into a position where you might be able to outmaneuver your opponents. And we talk a lot about the sort of future characteristics of the capabilities that we're likely to want in this battle space. We think first and foremost, they're going to be smaller and faster capabilities to avoid detection. Uh, we think it's, we're probably going to reduce um, f- uh, reduced physical protection for increased mobility, uh, which falls out of the second one. Uh, we think we'll rely more heavily on low observable and stealth technologies. Uh, we think we will increasingly use electronic warfare and passive deception measures. Um, we expect it to be a mix of crude, uncrewed and autonomous platforms, probably more dispensable, probably cheaper, less exquisite, uh, because dispensability, I think, is going to be a, a really important feature. And of course, they've got to have an open systems ar- architecture. You've got to be able to plug them all into the system as a whole. Um, and that, I think, you know, is, is the holy grail. Uh, And that's one of the reasons why we, our modernization program, includes a huge amount of experimentation with outside influences, industrial industrial partners, but also allies, to try and pull together the acme of what that looks like. Because let's face it, it's going to affect the way we do acquisition. It's going to affect the way that we um, think about setting requirements. It's going to require a complete change in culture to be able to get the right mix of the information technologies necessary to be able to deliver this. One potential challenge that moving in this direction, and this is not a new one, but one potential challenge that uh, that some have raised, and I think there have been some NATO assessments along these lines, is the issue of interoperability, particularly among European allies and partners, as well as those on the North American side. And I think our rough count was eight different battle tanks in Europe, 11 hack attack helicopters, 13 fighter aircraft. And and then when you start getting into uh, ISR platforms and others, um, you know, there are multiple different types of, of systems and platforms. So how big of a challenge for for multilateral operations is it in this kind of environment that you've just laid out to to operate with allies and 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 partners and and how do we start to to fix some of the interoperability challenges that are likely to come down the road? Um, well, I think it comes down to rules in a sense and making sure that within NATO. I mean, when I was growing up, you'll remember there were some good things called NATO Stanags, and NATO Stanags defined quite a lot of the interoperability dimensions that we wanted to have within NATO. Well, I think we fundamentally need to do that, don't we, for software now and for data. And I don't think that's an insurmountable problem. Uh, I think if you look at some of the things that the new uh, NATO warfighting capstone concept is espousing, uh, which we as NATO Chiefs of Defence signed up to at our last CHODS meeting, I think in there there's this suggestion that we should be stipulating quite clearly what are going to be the the sort of the, the parameters in which we are going to share information. Now, we've done that before. Um, I mean, I, I always tell the story that when I took over as commander of RC South in Kandahar in 2009, I had, I think, seven different task forces under my command. Uh, and to talk to them uh, involved and equally talk to a U.S. Marine Corps one and a U.S. Army one required seven different types of communication methodology. When I left, we had managed to bring in the Afghan Mission Network, which was something that NATO stipulated and which nations signed up to, and which had a set of rules in which we shared the right sort of information, and we were able to connect ourselves together. Now, we managed to wheel that out in a year. I don't think this is insurmountable. I think it's a question of us agreeing a sensible set of rules and parameters, and then making sure that we understand the way in which the data is going to be managed through software that we can all access and can spirally develop. And I, I think that's a perfectly reasonable thing for us to espouse. Yeah, that's a that's a I think that's a that's a reasonable assessment. I wanted to shift gears a little bit, um, and we have a question actually from someone in the audience about the integrated review and the army. And the question gets to uh, the decrease in the in the size of the army, 
And the questioner asks about what the impact is likely to be on some future scenarios, including some of the Baltic ones, which involve Russian armor moving into Baltic states. So can you talk a little bit about, about future projections of the, of the UK army and what the potential impact is for some scenarios, at least that those in the US are, are looking closely at? Yes, um, I can. I mean, I think I think the important thing for us to do to begin with is to work out what are the most likely scenarios that are going to play out. And I talked earlier in our conversation about escalation and miscalculation. I mean, the reality, of course, is that if we take Russia as an example, you know, they are able um, because of their operating on interior lines to be able to generate um, a degree of mass in conventional terms, which would very rapidly overwhelm almost any part of our forward line. You know, in the three battle groups we've got deployed, for example, in the Baltics at the moment, all three very capable battle groups, but they're no more than a thousand strong in each battle group. But they would be very rapidly overwhelmed. And, you know, history, I think, you know, has a rhythm. It's not going to repeat itself. And if you look back at what occurred in the last century, the reality, I think, is that we are going to find ourselves confronted with something occurring, which we then have to respond to. And I think it's more how you play the response, which is the way the scenario would play out. And that, to my mind, does ask questions about the way in which you mobilize and your readiness. And I you know, am reasonably comfortable that um, the force levels that we've got within the British Army at the prescribed rate of readiness we need to be at within NATO can lead to mobilization that would enable us to field a couple of divisions, which is what NATO expects of us. Uh, and at the end of the day, that is the requirement. When you then combine that with the multi-domain uh, context that I described earlier, and we are one of the few NATO countries that espouses to be a player in all five domains, and you look at our geography and you look at the fact that we are very much a, a maritime player, you can see how when you are thinking about this from first principles and you have to make choices, you end up with the sort of force structure across those five domains that we've ended up with. Um, and, and that's the answer. We um, we also have always attached a great deal of credibility to our reserve. You know, it's a reserve of, you know, broadly speaking, 30,000. Uh, and and w- once that is mobilized, which, you know, we are rehearsing this year, you can see how an army of 100,000 pretty quickly becomes something that is, is viable in the context of generating a couple of divisions. So, you know, choices have to be made. We made choices. Uh, that's the structure. But I think you have to really look at the scenarios that play out and you have to really think about how you're going to provide the necessary deterrence. And, and I've heard people talk about the notion of porcupine defence, which is what you see in Finland in particular. And that's probably a slightly more nuanced way of thinking about how we might actually defend against the sort of things that Russia is going to offer uh, over the next two to three years, I would have thought. Well, there's another part of any of these uh, scenarios and games, and that is the the use of uh, of fifth and sixth generation fighters. And I know that the uh, the uh, UK is committed to buy more than I believe 48 F-35, uh, at least under contract. I, I'm not sure they've confirmed the size and timing of the next tranche. Uh, I know the UK is also investing in new sixth generation future combat air system, the Tempest. So can you just talk for a, for a little bit how you're thinking about sort of fifth and sixth generation fighters? Because they play they play an important role, I think, in, in any of these scenarios, in, including ones actually in the Indo-Pacific as well. No, indeed. Um, and, um, you know, we're now fielding uh, the F-35 uh, on our carrier. Uh, and when it, the carrier deploys to um, the Mediterranean, then onwards through the Indian Ocean to the Pacific uh, during the course of this year, it will take with it... Um, um, our jets, as well as U.S. Marine Corps jets, and um, we're, you know, we're discovering that this is an extraordinary capability. Um, it's a capability that has got certainly got limitations in terms of range and reach, but nonetheless, it is a, an extraordinary capability. And our judgment is that, you know, with the UK being back in the carrier business, uh, we will need probably over the course of the next decade to get um, rather more F-35s than we've currently got in the armory. I mean, I think we'll probably end up having to to think hard about how we get to a figure of well over 70 in order to be able to sustain our carrier capability out to um, out to sort of 2060, which is what it's designed to do. But we also recognise that the, the Typhoon, which is the fourth generation aircraft we've got in service at the moment, uh, that is going to um, 
come out of service increasingly by 2040, and we need to replace it with something. But we are looking at this in a slightly different way for it being a a like-for-like replacement in sixth generation terms. What we're actually looking for is a system, And, and the system will be a mix of, I suspect, crewed and uncrewed aircraft, Although at the moment, the emphasis of our program is very much on the uncrewed aspect of it. So we're looking, for example, uh, at a couple of uncrewed complementary capabilities alongside what might be an aircraft with a man in it. And that is, first of all, what we are calling uh, Alvina, which is a disposable swarming drone that can be controlled by the man in the loop at the center of the system. Secondly, we're looking at an uncrewed fighter, what we're calling Mosquito, which is a concept demonstrator, uh, which would take the man out of the loop for much of what we might do in the future. Clearly, though, um, we believe that at the heart of this, there's got to be a man. Now, whether that man is sitting in a sixth generation aircraft or whether the sixth generation aircraft is an uncrewed aircraft remains to be seen. We are looking at it in in that sort of systematic way. What I think is exciting about the way that we're doing it, though, and it goes to the point I made earlier about how we need to think about acquisition in the future and how we set requirements, is that because the future is moving so quickly, it's really difficult for us to imagine and to write a requirement these days that will be a requirement that stands the test of obsolescence over the next few years. So what we're doing is we're trying to create this as an enterprise with industry. And this Tempest program has got some 10 tier one industry partners and then several tens of small and medium sized enterprises. And what that is achieving is really quite remarkable innovation at pace. Now, none of that is specified in a requirement. All of it is completely open innovation as an enterprise with our Air Force and indeed increasingly with international partners. And our view is that this will create a very different means of acquisition. And it's that sort of approach on an enterprise basis that we think will roll out to other technologies as well. So what I think is really exciting about what we call our Tempest program is that it's actually a technology program. And it's a program that's going to lead to this sort of quite innovative spiral development in partnership with industry, but also with other international partners, which will get you to the sixth generation effect. And I think, you know, it's not going to be something that's static in time. It's going to continue to evolve. And that is, I think, likely to have to be the way that we go in the future because of the rapid pace of technological change. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, We've got a few minutes left, so I wanted to go to a couple of other audience questions as well. And um, what one uh, individual writes in and says uh, and and wants to come to the nuclear issue, which is a 15 percent increase in warheads, And it's a two-part question. And the first one is, uh, does this cut against the letter or at least the spirit of the NPT, what the the UK has done? And the second question is, what technologies does the Ministry of Defense believe could meet the the threshold? Um, Happy to to expound a little bit more on that. But the two-part questions on the nuclear side. Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to get too much into the politics of this for obvious reasons, wearing my military uniform. Um, What I would say, though, is that, you know, our defence secretary, the equivalent of your SECDEF, is on the record of saying, you know, this is essentially about capability. And I don't think one needs to go further than that. What I would say, and I think is is more interesting, um, is that when we were growing up, uh, there was some really great academic stuff written about the concept of limited war, about nuclear deterrence, about escalation management, you know, and all of the all of the good stuff that we grew up with. I think um, the current context is crying out for some really good stuff to be written about what modern deterrence looks like and what escalation management looks like. Because increasingly, with the new domains, particularly of space and cyber, it is very challenging to attribute. It's very challenging to understand how you might escalate in cyber and de-escalate perhaps in other domains or whatever it might be. You know, all of a sudden, no longer is your escalation going to be up a single ladder. It's going to have to happen up multiple ladders, a bit more like a spider's web. And I think the really interesting question is, how do you play the modern weaponry? These missiles, which might well look when they're launched exactly like a nuclear weapon. How do you how do you bring all this together? How do you think about multidimensional deterrence? 
multidimensional escalation management. And the new complex weapons are going to confuse and make that a challenge. And I think we urgently need to debate on this, not least because, to the point I make about escalation leading to unwarranted miscalculation, um, because that's a challenge, particularly when you think about the fact that the arms control um, organization and structure that we grew up with, you know, is limping now. You know, if uh, President Biden had extended new start back in February, there wouldn't be a single one of these treaties still remaining. Um, and we need to think really hard from a, you know, US UK perspective and with our friends and allies about what sort of regime should we be asking for in this new world? What does it look like? Um, and, um, you know, are the current international institutions fit for purpose when it comes to working out how you're going to control some of this stuff? And I think we need to bring on a proper academic debate and then work out how we're going to achieve the effect of controlling this, but also understanding how you conduct escalation and de-escalation in what is a much, much more complex environment than the one that our forebears grew up in. So some of the debates and the modeling that you referred to, I remember, came out of organizations like RAND that did its mutually assured destruction uh, and looked at the modeling uh, that led to a lot of the thought in the 60s and 70s about nuclear deterrence. Um, I want to just pull on this thread a little bit on the cyber side, because we've seen, say, the Russians uh, conduct offensive operations in Ukraine using black energy, gray energy, in destroyer against the Ukrainians as part of the war there. I mean, targeting the electricity grid, targeting companies, uh, targeting critical infrastructure. Uh, they've obviously done it uh, against uh, U.S. elections, not just the 2016, but 2020 ones as well. So how are you thinking, and you raised this earlier, but how are you thinking about deterrence on the cyber side in particular? And will or can we get to a point where we can deter at least some actions, some types of, of actions against adversaries? I mean, I think, um, I think you know, cyber doctrine is evolving, isn't it? Um, you know, I think we understand that there are, there are some interesting um, overlaps and dynamics between defensive and offensive cyber. Uh, and I think, you know, the whole business of um, computer network exploitation and how you play that into the defense versus the offense and understanding what the possibilities are is, is proving to be a really interesting um, game of cat and mouse, which is being played out on a, on a daily basis. So I think that um, it's evolving. Um, I think that one of the things that's exciting about what we're doing in our defence modernisation programme is the way that we are with our GCHQ, our government um, communications headquarters, creating an, a, a new national cyber force. And one of the things that I think is absolutely fascinating about this is that, you know, we talk about these sorts of things. We talk about process, people and technology. And the conversation that we're having this afternoon, we're not really talking about the people in this. And I always say, it's almost always my concluding observation when I give a speech, is that, you know, it's the people that represent our adaptive foundation. And I think that's fascinating about cyber for me, is how you generate the human capacity to be able to manage this uh, from models that are, in military terms, bottom fed, uh, conventional, you know, we expect, don't we, our military people to look a bit like I look like now, but perhaps a bit younger. Um, we don't expect them to perhaps, you know, look like the sort of geeks that perhaps are going to be the people that we really need to be able to play in this domain. So I think there's a, there's a whole raft of issues in here which uh, are exercising, you know, General Nakasone and, and our people over here in order to try and make this come, a, come to fruition. Um, now, you know, back to the game, I mean, I, I, ultimately, you know, you, you demonstrate your capability, but you certainly don't do it in a way that uh, allows any attribution to occur. It, it's all about mystery, isn't it? And I think that um, the doctrine according to mystery is what will probably be at the heart of the way in which you exercise cyber deterrence. Well, thanks for that answer. Yes, there will be uh, considerable mystery in this arena moving forward, probably less so historically in the nuclear arena. But this really uh, uh, brings us to the end. And I, I want to thank you for taking time, General Carter, to talk with us and urge uh, folks on this side of the Atlantic to uh, to read the integrated review. I think it's a thoughtful, strategic level document in the defense compendium that goes with it and want to pre and, and, and want to uh, reinforce, I think, the importance 
on this side of the Atlantic of the UK-US special relationship, which remains critical, I think, to, to how we see things moving forward. No, Seth, well, thank you very much for, for letting me come, as it were, on the show. It's been a great pleasure to re-engage with you as well. Uh, and I look forward to the debate continuing. Thank you. Thank you very much.